Hello, this is looking at market failure and government intervention, but from the point of view of the A2 part of the course. So it looks like a big part of the specification, but um, first line is candidates will be expected to extend and develop the models of market failure introduced in Unit 1. So make sure you revise all of those Unit 1 concepts that introduced market failure. So your merit goods, your demerit goods, positive externalities, negative externalities, public goods, uh, immobility of labour, uh, monopolies you'll have already done, um, and there was another one, inequality as well, which you'll already have done um, as a part of this course. Um, but make sure you've really revised over those unit one notes, because remember, this part of the course is synoptic, meaning that they're testing you on information sometimes that you've done in your AS part of the course. Um, but we're just going to go into a little bit more detail on a few of the concepts that came up. So public goods is one of those concepts that we're going to go into a little bit more detail. So you probably remember that public goods are goods that are non-excludable and non non-rivalry. So non-excludable means that you can't exclude someone from consuming it. And non-rivalry means more for one person doesn't mean less for another person. So it's what we call sometimes non-diminishable. And uh, it sounds great, but why does it lead to market failure? Well, it's really a problem with it being non-excludable that leads to market failure because when it's non-excludable, you get free riders. And these are people who consume it, but they don't contribute to it. And uh, the private sector, if you're thinking of a business whose um, sole motivation, or maybe not sole motivation, but main motivation is to make profit, to be able to make profit, you need to be able to make revenue. Now, if you have free riders, um, according to traditional economic theory, everyone would, uh, because there's perfect um, information in a perfect market, but everyone would see these free riders and they think, well, if they're getting away with not paying for it, why am I paying for it? That's an illogical decision. So no one would pay for it. Then the private sector wouldn't make any revenue. They wouldn't be able to cover their costs. And it's what we call an example of a missing market. So the market just wouldn't exist. And therefore, the government have to step in and provide it. And that's why we call it a public good. That's where we get the name from. Um, but remember, not everything that the government provides is a public good. Um, it has to have that characteristic of being non-excludable or non-rivalry. Now, there are only a few things in life that really kind of meet those criteria. So um, sometimes we um, come up with uh, the, the term quasi-public to just demonstrate that they've got some of the characteristics of a public good, but not all of them. So a private good would be rivalry and excludable. So a quasi, or some people say quasi, public good would have some characteristics of being a public good. So um, I explain it to my students as saying, well, it might be non-excludable, but rivalry or non-rivalry, but excludable or it could just be kind of non-excludable up to a certain point uh, or non-rivalry up to a certain point so it could be kind of a mixture of those features as well so this is another specification objective examples of where technology has made an item excludable where it wasn't before remember it's that excludability that caused all the problems and the free riders so i mean this is a really old example i suppose the exam system you're doing is quite old but um uh Public broadcasting um, is sort of as a, a public good, and before these, I don't even know what he's holding, these kind of devices to track people, um, it would have been thought of as uh, non-excludable. But now we can we can find people that are watching TV without paying their TV license. Um, and the congestion charge as well in, in London. So one of the problems with charging people for road use for, you know, when they use it, I mean, we all should, if we've got a car, be paying road tax, but that depends upon the type of car you've got. And it's not um, a payment that you make every journey you make. But um, the and one of the reasons that you can't, it, or it's very hard to charge people for the roads that they use, is that you'd have to build lots of toll booths, and then that's expensive, that's difficult to do. And and previously the technology hadn't been there, but now with all this like GPS technology and uh, license plate recognition cameras and all those types of things, uh, we can have things like the London congestion charge. In previous years, um, there was this uh, proposal, the a national road pricing proposal, which would mean that you had to pay for um, the roads that you travel on, and it would the the amount you pay would um, change depending on the road you were travelling on and the time of day that you were travelling. And so, if it was like a really quiet country road, maybe it's like a penny a mile, whereas if it was a road in the middle of a uh, 
a town it would be a lot more expensive and this was going to work off like gps technology but obviously it would be very very expensive and when we went into recession this idea kind of got scrapped but there was that idea that th this would make you know kind of the roads excludable because because roads can be um one of those things that we think of as a quasi public good and then then you get kind of the uh, tragedy of the commons people overusing that kind of common item uh, and then you get congestion and bad things happening with um you know more um emissions and uh, co2 emissions and pollution and things like that so funny i just mentioned that here are some environmental market failures so we get environmental market failures in production so thinking of atmospheric pollution and possibly visual pollution as well and noise pollution but we also get it in consumption as well i, I just think about <laughs> visual pollution noise pollution maybe people are consuming lots of alcohol and causing a nuisance because of it in town centers um and we've also got um information failure where consumers or producers are unable to maximize welfare and make good decisions because of a lack of information so maybe they're over consuming a product they're under consuming a product they don't realize the private costs they don't realize external costs or private benefits and external benefits of their actions so um, we get um, merit goods and demerit goods and positive um, positive externalities and negative externalities because of that um, and a lack of property rights can cause this as well so consumers producers uh, can damage the environment is no one has um, ownership over it so um it's a funny concept these days because we know you know if you dump something into a river people will find out about it the environmental agencies will find out about it and they will fine you for it but it's not that the environmental agencies have ownership of the rivers in the UK it's that we've we've got a legal system that kind of says that they can take action um, against people that do that but um, if we didn't have this legal system and environmental agencies we could say well there's this real lack of property rights and so no one kind of takes responsibility of it you get this tragedy of the commons problem where people are over consuming it or dumping what we can call bads rather than goods into the atmosphere and into the environment um, and we can draw some diagrams like this for it so in terms of production I'm always thinking about factories as well here so if they only take into account their costs their private costs this is uh, where they would produce whereas if they took into account the full social cost of activities the full um, cost of activities their supply would be further inwards to the left Left. and so the distance here between the two is the negative externality or the the external cost and we have a situation here we've got this welfare loss so we've got overproduction in this market um, and um, I think this diagram here is showing that um, we should be at this Q star point we're actually at Q1 point so we need some regulation to shift it in there or we could deal with it with an indirect tax as well can't I um, here we have um, a negative externality in consumption so something consumers are um, uh, consuming sorry some <laughs> purchasing consuming um, they uh, aren't really taking into account the full cost of their activities so we've got this again it's over consumption so they're actually consuming at q1 when they should be consuming a Q star here so we've got this triangle pointing this way showing the welfare loss and overconsumption and the costs because of that overconsumption and the vertical distance being this external cost um, and maybe if we had some advertisements to make it clear to people that they were their consumption was harming you know I'm thinking um, from the previous example I used of alcohol consumption you know that they're harming their their local economy or uh, people's um, uh, enjoyment of their their town center and causing damage and causing costs for policing and hospital beds and all those types of things if we could make people aware of that maybe they would change their behavior again um, maybe they would maybe they wouldn't it depends and it depends on how nice you think people are and how how understanding how how much you think someone's going to take into account external costs of their actions so some of the solutions as I mentioned before assigning property rights now this internalizes that external externality so we have environment agencies who protect our kind of like our, our um, environment sorry obvious uh, you know our uh, waterway I think we've got waterways agency as well who protect you know, canals and rivers and things like that and um, uh, we'll take we'll find people that cause damage uh, things but again very big um, 
very very big um, uh, environment that we have and it's hard to catch everybody and it might not be um, economical to take every smaller polluter to court we also have i mean workers um we've got property rights assigned to workers so it's now like law that they can take legal action against their employers if they're hurt at work so that's a, another example um water companies can charge businesses that dump waste into water as well if uh, it makes it much harder for the water companies to decontaminate and uh, purify the water for drinking we can also get indirect taxation and this internalizes the externality by um, by giving the business this extra cost of production that increases their cost of production that reduces supply uh, moves supply inwards to the left we could have regulation this sets a very clear limit on outputs uh, or enforces information um, so it, sorry on that last point there I'm just thinking about kind of regulation on cigarette packaging that says you know they, they have to have no branding or, um, they have to have warning sorry and they, they can't have any branding on them these days I read a really interesting article actually about this design company that were tasked with finding the most disgusting colour out there to try and put people off cigarettes so that I think now it's going to come into law that you have to the, the fonts or the typeface or uh, any any lettering or whatever that's on the packet of cigarettes has to be in this particular colour and I can only describe this colour as like a brownish uh, sorry a brownish a greenish brown a brownish would be a good good word for it actually it's really there's just something about this colour you could you could google it actually and probably find this color but it's it's not it's not a very nice color and that would be regulation the government says you have to print everything on your cigarette packets in this color to try and put them off tradable permits as well this sets a clear limit um, on output so it's partly it's really interesting this one it's it's a mix of regulation because it's setting a clear limit it's setting a cap it's giving people um, permits to pollute up to a certain level so it's kind of sort of assigning property rights saying okay it's all right for you to pollute up to this level um, it also uses subsidies because if somebody's polluting below that level in, in terms of subsidy uh, somebody I mean a firm if somebody's if a firm is polluting below that level they can sell their additional permits and raise revenue so that provides an incentive for them to be cleaner and maybe money for them to invest into clean technology in the future and it's also uh, like an indirect tax because if you're polluting above that minimum level you have to purchase additional permits and so that um, has all the, the benefits of kind of raising um, money but the money then goes to um, the people that are cleaner so it's, it's not like you know an indirect tax when the money goes to the government this is uh, this provides the money for the reward for the cleaner producers so it's a bit of a mix of all of them actually it's a really interesting thing to look at so that's a bit of a whistle stop tour of all those specification objectives I'm going to add to the playlist some of the ones that I made for the AS course because those are really interesting to review as well if this does come up as a question I always think it's a really good one to do in exams because um, it's a lot of AS content that you can put in there and you've had a lot longer to learn this AS content so you should be really good at it but the key is make sure you have gone over that AS content and that you're not just um, putting down lots of statements without analysis and evaluation so this has been a very quick overview of what's on the AT specification it hasn't been very much analysis and evaluation make sure you're looking at those AS videos that I've made as well